hope you all ate beforehand because we're talking about food. <laughs> <laughs> so Hannah Fugana um, is a lecturer in liberal studies at NYU London. And yeah, she's going to talk about lechon. Yeah, <laughs> Rizal dreams of lechon. <laughs> Civic education and swine line nationalism in the southern Philippines. So while we're waiting for Hannah to set up her um, presentation, I'd just like to make a couple of uh, announcements. Um, so I'm at Humboldt University in Berlin, and we are have been running the platform Philippine Study Series in Berlin since 2014. So I encourage you to have a look at it. We're on Facebook. And also starting this month, no, last month, um, I'm heading the project Advancing Philippine Studies at Humboldt University, similar to the project here at SOAS. And we will launch it on July 29 with a lecture by archaeologist Armand Mijares on the discovery of the Homo Luzonensis. This will be held at Humboldt University. And the last announcement is we are also convening me, meaning, we, meaning our department at Humboldt University, the European Southeast Asian Studies Conference, which will be held on September 10th to 13th. And I hope to see some of you again there. All right, Hannah. Okay. Well, um, I'd like to thank uh, all the speakers on the panel I'm on, because there's a lot of continuities, a lot of themes kind of coming back, uh, among them U.S. vocational mentality, uh, ethnicity and, um, well, ethnicity building. Uh, oh. I'm just gonna. Is it us or? Can everyone here? Okay. Uh, yeah, and also these this kind of racial discourse um, with the industrial school movement uh, during the American period. Uh, so yeah, as I said, my paper will kind of touch on these things, uh, but I think it's also going to talk about the Spanish period as well, and not just focus on the Americans, and then kind of try to see where it goes um, towards independence, uh, Philippine independence. So I'll just start. So this is a quote from, I start with a quote from uh, the Bible, Philippines being very Christian, it seemed pretty apt. I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and ate it. It tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach turned sour. Then I was told, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. Jose Rizal began writing a story in the 1880s about a hog earmarked for slaughter. Although he never finished it, most readers have now recognized the story's significance within the Rizal canon as a satirical allegory in which Spain's colonial project is called into question, and those subject to its tyranny are posed to prevail. Some have seen in its por porky protagonist something of a Padre Damaso or Sil Silvi, uh, not least because Rizal scribbles on the last page outlining the opening premise of the Noli. Others have discussed the ailing animal community on the farm where the story takes place as a metaphor for 19th century society in the Philippine archipelago as a whole. But it also highlights a more deeply felt aspect of the colonial condition, speaking to the heart, or rather the stomach, of what it meant to be Filipino in an archipelago supposedly united by the dispersed institutions of Spanish and colonial rule. In this paper, I want to use Rizal's story to reflect on the uses and meanings of food and animal husbandry in the context of decolonization and nation building, to suggest that Rizal's gastropolitique contained within it a vital critique of post-colonial nationhood that has seldom been uh, recognized. As a commentary on Spanish colonialism by highlighting the role of farms in food production, Rizal is speaking to the complex power relations held in tension across the diverse archipelago of competing and overlapping traditions, both culinary and political. Thinking about pigs in particular not only opens up a social anthropology of lechon in Philippine civic education, broadly defined, uh, from the colonial period onwards, but more pertinently for this conference, shedding critical light on the Philippines' internal southern frontier between the Visayas and Mindanao. The discursive function of pigs and pork in delineating what I call the swine line uh, has not only shaped Filipinos' nationalist identifications, but concurrently elicits a frontier politics of colonial neo-colonial expansion. Considering also Rizal's own partiality towards Mindanao, this paper will reconsider his cultural, culinary, and effective desire to include the region within a nation that might transcend its colonial inheritances and begin to envisage and enact new modes of cosmopolitan belonging. 
And Los Animales, uh, Los Animales de Swan, Swan's Animals, Rizal's young narrator Demas tells the story of a pig named Botioc. Castrated by Swan, a farmhand employed by Demas's father, Botioc can sire no piglets before his inevitable demise, but he is nonetheless convinced of his superiority over the other animals on the farm, lording over them his impotence, a gift from their god Swan, a uh, Swan. The gluttonous potentate of his very own fiefstai, Botioc demands extra food and fidelity uh, in exchange for salvation that he claims only he can provide. Uh, quote from the story. Uh, I, as Swan's chosen one, will lift you up where you will live amid grains of rice for eternity. End quote. When an incredulous chick deigns to challenge Botioc's version of reality, the Grand Cardo, Caro's followers rebuke him, crying out, false, ideolog uh, ideolatry, heretics, excommunication. Swan will condemn you to live in the pond. Fearing the water, the baby fowl falls silent. Uh, the story is particularly interesting, given the explicit role of castration as a source of the pig's power and authority. Uh, in the Lacanian mode, castration poses both a threat and promise. Uh, in severing the colonized subject from the mother protoculture, it promises instead the benefits of the father, a colonial culture. Botioc and Bissayan is quite literally a parasitic imposter, a bitik, common intestinal worm, whose credo is bitok, a sham, and festers like a botok, a blister, on the societal body of the farm. The animal's edible devotion to the great pig is nevertheless understandable, inescapable even, given the overwhelming allure of what Homi Baba calls the disavowal of difference. The animals accept Batyak's reign in spite uh, of its perversions, in order to alleviate the more immediate anxiety associated with lack and difference. Colonialism finds its ideal form when the animals of the farm police and repress themselves. Speaking through his alter ego, Demas, the heir to wise King Solomon who abstained from eating pork, Rizal appeals to all of the animals, all peoples that called the, the Philippine archipelago home, to break the cycle of cultural, religious, and intellectual emasculation. Under no illusions about the seduction of the Catholicism preached by the Cochinos, Rizal cautions his domestic readers that to emancipate themselves from the clerical behemoths of the colonial farm, they must reconcile rather than deny their differences. They must do so on their own terms, forming, forming organic solidarities with each other therein. But it is to no avail in the face of the domination, domestication, and exploitation endemic to both this fictional farm and Rizal's colonial imaginary. The story ends with the poultry's acquiescence in the pig's fetishism, and we are left to conclude that all of the farm animals, castrated or not, will inevitably find themselves on the butcher's block. In the 122 years since Rizal's own execution in 1896, the pigs maintain their hegemony. Botok's death and resurrection as Lechon are reenacted by Filipinos at home and abroad, vindicating them on Christian feast days and daily life. Bonds of familial kinship and devotion to Southeast Asia's only self-avowed Catholic nation are simultaneously renewed around Lechon's centerpieces, quasi-secular altars uh, to an imagined community articulated in a plethora of settings, ranging from the opulent fiesta, uh, expatriate reunion, and restaurant buffet, to the more mundane lunch counter, Lazy Susan, and kitchen in the family home. Clean, drained, stuffed, and skewered, spit or oven roasted, while the entree varies from province to province, island to island, barangay to barangay, all of which claim to have the most piquant ang pinaka masarap na luchon, the basics remain the same, as does the uniquely collectivizing nature of its preparation. Anyone can roast a chicken, but it takes a village to prepare luchon. Although nowadays recipes call for smaller suckling pigs, symbolically Botioc is more intoxicating and international uh, than ever. Revered yet unremarkable, the dish has come to define the archipelago's belonging to a wider post-colonial Christian world, alongside a secular gastronomic identity, subject to a Francophilic hierarchy of taste. As an emissary of Philippine civilization, especially, Lechon raises broader questions over those among its denizens who do not partake in the original, uh, ritual business of pigs. Just as the ongoing outbreak of African swine fever in Asia's traditional pork powerhouses of China and Vietnam promises to be an economic boon for the thus far unaffected Philippines, inhabitants of its southern provinces are repeatedly reminded of the imbalanced power relationships between metropole and periphery, or what Aryana Padurai terms gastropolitics, the conflict or competition over specific cultural or economic resources as it emerges in social transactions around food. 
The Backyard Raisers Association in Davao City, for example, have appealed to the Philippine government to explore the opportunity of Mindanao as an exporter of meat to other countries. Intuitively, this makes sense given that Mindanao is home to nearly half of the country's uh, 10.7 million Muslims who do not eat, let alone raise pigs. But with regards to who benefits from this expansion of the pork industry, there is considerably more at stake. Both backyard operations and commercial pig farms are concentrated uh, in parts of Mindanao where the Christian presence is more pronounced and those known as Moros do not stand to subst uh, substantially benefit, whether directly by the way of money or indirectly through the education hog raising traditionally supports. The Bangsamoro Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao is quite literally surrounded by pork, a looming arc of pig production from Bukidnon to South Cotabato, penning the province's in inhabitants with little choice, uh, penning the provincial uh, choice, uh, but to fight back. If we employ the swine line, or lines rather, as a mean by which to think through the multidimensional site that extends beyond Mindanao, upwards through the archipelago, and further still to the global north, a more gelatinous story emerges. Domestically, the curve around Bangsamoro is both thick and porous, encompassing the Visayas, whose people make up the majority of Mindanao's Christian population. Their hostilities in Mindanao are also felt intensely, if only because of the island group's proximity and therefore susceptibility to the fallout. They weigh heavily on the Visayan psyche, which, by virtue of its own cultural difference from the Manila metropole, feels compelled to side with Tagalog compatriots on this particular issue. When a Michelin-starred chef like Anthony Bourdain asserts, as he did in 2008, that Diasen Cebuanu Lechon is the best pig ever, he's not merely putting Filipino food on the proverbial world culinary map. Uh, he is standing on the front of a conflict that threatens the nation's aspirations to global modernity from within, uh, along uh, fatty fault lines from colonial and post-colonial Luzon to the Sulu Sea. Uh, from this vantage point, uh, this is from the Boxer Codex, if you, yeah. Uh, from this vantage point, Los Animales de Swan can be read as a parable about the anti antagonistic side of Philippine nation building, the will of a regionally and linguistically diverse, yet decidedly Christian majority, exercised over Mindanao's inhabitants through culinary psychopolitics and neoliberal narratives of economic development. These narratives have roots in the archipelago's imperial history, from Spain's global reconquista in the early modern period to the settler colonialism of the American Commonwealth. They have also been shaped by trends in global history, broader motors of change, uh, which allied monolithic European vis-a-vis -vis, uh, indigenous agency, giving birth to and since remaking the modern world. Pigs served in a colonial capacity in the Philippine archipelago, imposing on extant ecosystems long before European contact. Hogs had traveled along with other fauna and flora in successive waves of Australasian migration between 4,000 and 4,500 years ago. Local inhabitants, akin to Mesoamericans uh, and the buccaneers of Hispaniola, raised and hunted these pigs, which took to the hunted those pigs, which took to the hinterlands. With Chinese envoys, merchants, and mercenaries from the 19th century onwards, came more pigs, a phenomenon that contributed to the entry of the Chinese word katai to slaughter for eating into the region's lexicon. The black baboy damon wild pig was endemic by the time the Portuguese explorer Ferdinand Magellan arrived on the shores of the southern Philippines in 1521 with pigs of his own. As Claude Levi Strauss once said of the South American peccary, the so-called native Philippine pig constituted not only a zoological entity but also a social, social fact. In his famous account of Magellan's fateful last voyage, the Venetian Antonio Pigafetta um, delineated the ritualistic role pigs played on the island of Cebu how their value to the Indios seemed to be less about sustenance or nutrition than about establishing social hierarchies and gastronomic taboos. As suggested by the passing over of the Castile, as local people called them, in the ceremony, Europeans did not have a place in, in this society, a society to which women performed religious rites, bridging the earthly and sacred worlds. In this respect, Pigafetta and his Catholic compatriots were decidedly outsiders. Only by observing and documenting this community, so alien to their own, could they amass enough knowledge with which to gain a seat at the table. In other parts of Spain's empire, conquistadors gave indigenous peoples little choice but to accept the introduction of the Iberian pig. Alfred Crosby described in his work on the Colombian exchange how poor, hungry Iberians delighted in the animal's transportability, self-sufficiency, and ability to breed in the new worlds. Of the locals' attitudes towards the old word pig, 
Benjamin Zadik has more recently asserted that because the Spanish prevented the natives from raising their own cattle and horses, their turn to pig domestication was more the product of coercion. Similar dynamics emerged in the Philippine context where, as Benela Canal has noted, the systems of tax farming, encomiendas, exaction of tribute, labor corvées, and forced purchase of produce, vandala, placed extremely heavy demands on the population. These systems were critical to Castile's colonial project in the South, uh, the south especially, where according to Patricia Abenales uh, and uh, Donna Amaraso, the state's uh, periodic requisitioning of food, including hogs, at lower than market rates, financed frequent wars with the Muslims and with the Dutch. But this economic exploitation also relied heavily on local conversion uh, to Christianity. Here the pig comes into its own as a digestible interlocutor between colonial and pre-existing notions of morality and morbidity, mortality and rebirth. Second, perhaps only to the Eucharistic wafer, Lechon proved most effective in uniting and mobilizing the converted in service to the Spanish crown. And unlike un other fixtures in Philippine, well, Philippine cuisine, Lechon did not rely on foreign cooking methods or ingredients. Uh, it was already special. Often the only representatives of the crown on the ground, uh, Iberian missionaries found it far easier, if not imperative, to reconfigure existing indigenous rituals, like the pig blessing that Pigafetta witnessed, in such a way as to instill Christian values of charity, justice, and alms. But as Market Ma uh, Marcel Mauss argued, uh, the bestowal of these values was conditional on, on reciprocal sacrifice and obligation. The friars justified their demand for pork on Spay's behalf as a fair exchange for the gift of faith. What Magellan, his men, and the Europeans after them did when they unleashed their pale pigs to propagate the Philippine Islands, thus transcended the material, signaling a, a seismic shift in the history of ideas and society across the archipelago. By the 19th century, frontier opposition to subsequent colonial administrations and ecclesiastical orders played out through a politics articulated through pork. Whereas the Ifugao in the north continued to prevail upon the Suscrufa uh, native pig in rituals and feasts to project the rejection of Catholicism and its agents, moral resistance in the south became increasingly associated with their pork abstaining Muslim faith. In Mindanao, the pig's figurative role as both evangelist and executioner was particularly pronounced. As Spain as Spanish forces struggled to contain moral threats to coastal and maritime trade through conventional means of military force and religious conversion, they turned to myth-making so as to capitalize on pre-existing fears of newly Christianized communities over Moros' purported proclivities for slavery and savagery. The link of such traits to non-consumption and control of certain foods had not manifested before to the degree it did under the Spanish. By Pigafetta's estimation, Hindu-sized rulers ate pigs less to distinguish themselves from the Moros of Borneo than out of a greed, greedy, greedy, uh, sorry, yeah, sorry, quote, greedy desire to keep them all for themselves. They did not force Muslims to eat pigs or bring them up in the country. Nor was indignation um, over moral enslavement of conquered non-Muslim peoples thought of solely on religious, let alone gastro-religious grounds. But by making this long-standing source of ecological trauma a matter of cultural contagion, the Spanish were able to achieve what past invaders had not. Arguably, it was only by voicing pressure on this formerly self-contained universe through the new Christian rhetoric of the swine line that the Castilian blockades of piratical moral strongholds finally succeeded, allowing the Spanish to consolidate their rule over much, but not all, of the southern Philippines by the 1850s. When Spain ceded the Philippines at the conclusion of the Spanish-American War in 1898, the United States inherited Spanish methods for dealing with ongoing insurgencies from Mindanao to Luzon. In a particularly evocative scene from Henry Hathaway's uh, 1939 film, The Real Glory, Lieutenant Canavan acts on the advice of a local Spanish friar, forcing native constabar uh, constabularies to watch as a fellow American and curiously British soldiers attempted to wrap a, a captured Moro fighter in pigskin lying on the ground. Parroting the mythology born out of the real-life exploits of General John Black Pershing in Mindanao, the scene is on the one hand reminiscent of Spanish-era propaganda about Moros, um, their parasitic predation, subhuman savagery, and above all, their superstitious fear of swine. On the other, it attests to the Anglo-American innovation of the Moros 
as a distinct homogeneous group whose more primitive impulses could be tamed, and as Michael Hawkins has suggested, repositioned with an evolutionary chronological spectrum affirming the possibilities of imperial tutelage. The granting of nominal independence from the United States in 1934, the Philippines' first generation of internationally and locally uh, trained civil servants, educators, and publishers, set about devising a, former, a formal program of civic education for their fledgling nation. Food and foodstuffs would yet again play a key role. Under the watchful eye of colonial administrators, Thomasites, and venture capitalists, this Christian, Luzon-based, and educationally oriented middle class promoted home economics as a means of instilling the archipelago's youth with the sense of national identity, uh, both cultural and vocational in nature, which could in turn be put to use within the emerging American neo-colonial commonwealth system. By the 1950s, for example, the Abiva Publishing House's catalog features school textbooks uh, teaching students how to make modern Filipino dishes, to do arithmetic using native animals and produce, and to identify other natural resources that could be found and exploited uh, in their home provinces. So these are just the, some of the covers of the stuff I've been looking at for this. Uh, in the spirit of the American small business model, food science manuals showed promising female entrepreneurs how to raise and butcher chickens and pigs. Alongside social studies, this aspirational yet also relatable home economics curriculum proved highly popular in primary and secondary schools, ensuring pork and food more generally became ingrained in the Philippine psyche. Absent from these and other instructional texts from the immediate post-colonial period, however, are the voices of those who do not practice the same Christian faith. When Aviva textbooks refer to moros, it is concise and evasive. But reading between the lines, we see the return of colonial, uh, colonial era language describing, and I'm gonna be, these are quotes, uh, the wrath and vengeance imparted on poor barrio folks in Sulu by the, by the moros, enemies of their forebears. We observe the Philippine government continuing the American practice of bringing settlers to work as uh, homesteaders in the uncultivated but rich areas in Mindanao. We see the encouraging of people, particularly in the South, to like and feel proud of rural life in the face of poverty and sectarian violence. The 20th century correspondingly witnessed the suppression of Rizal's favorable view of the yeah, of the uh, southern Philippines, either through omission or reinterpretation. Another archetypal cate uh, catechistic, uh, catechistic uh, Abiva title, Making Friends with Young Rizal, focuses on parts of his pre-European life, while ignoring Rizal's formative exile in North northern Mindanao uh, in the 1890s. One can still visit the garden that Rizal planted in the Dapitan town plaza, cut back into the shape of Mindanao to instruct local boys, Christian, Lumad, or Muslim, on the resources available to help their communities wean themselves off of the foreign goods peddled by Chinese merchants. As he advised the young women of Malolos, one must always question one's faith, analyze carefully the kind of religion taught you, then compare that religion with the pure religion of Christ, and see if your Christianity is not like the milking animals or like the pig that is being fattened. Only then, he argued, could they, as Filipinos, hope to break free. When Rizal met his demise in Manila's uh, yeah, in Leonardo Park a few years ago. His dream of a united archipelago died with him. As Baba asserted, the modern nation is innately more rhetorical than the reason of state. More metho mo more meth okay, yeah, sorry, <laughs> it's trying to get to me now. Uh, more, myth <laughs> more mythological uh, than ideology, less homogeneous than hegemony, less centered than the citizen, more collective than the subject, more psychic than civility. Rizal did not even like pork. Yet in the face of the galvanizing allure of the nation, the abstemious polymath would always need to be recast and reborn the red-blooded martyr. The swine line no longer cuts across just the Philippines. It has gone global. While the US colonial administration never designated the Dapitan uh, Mindanao map as Rizal National Park, it did bestow official recognition on another landscaped area uh, at the southernmost tip of the island of Zamboanga. Wow, I totally just forgot that, sorry. Uh, commemorating Pershing's military tenure in the region, since the 9-11 attacks, the American right-wing blogosphere has lit up with praise for Pershing, Pershing, the standard bearer of a homogeneous white nation, crediting his alleged use of pig's blood bullets against Moros and Mindao for there not having been a single Muslim extremist attack anywhere in the world for the next 42 years. 
Even the current US president has indulged metaphorically in pig, peddling this anti-Muslim mythology on the world stage and filling the cavity of his nation's public memory with its truth. But if we are to eat, or, but if we are what we eat, can we not eat or become something else? Exploring the space between the intersexual and the intestinal is critical to any such undertaking because it forces us to look beyond easy narratives of religious extremism and glaring animal carcasses. If civil society persists in making a pig's ear of Rizal's secular cause of politicism, we ought to think harder about the lines we draw in lard, the colonialisms we ingest, and eating the book. That's it. Thank you.